Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce Nugent Hopkins. Bruce, I see the uh, Nuge sweater there. Nicely yep. placed. <clears throat> nice. I got my, my sign 93 out tonight. I talked about it the other night when he got to 100 points, and I thought, geez, I should have had it wearing it or something. And I thought, <laughs> oh, when he hit 800 games tonight, big milestone. And I thought, well, whatever he does in the game, he's going to have the big milestone. So uh, I'm just going to put the uh, the old 93 signed, 93 blue on the uh, side there. That was uh, uh, from my time with the Oilers Analytics Working Group uh, that uh, you and I spent a little bit of time doing way back in the uh, uh, Steve Tambellini era. And Nugent Hopkins is literally the only guy left from that team. So I certainly chose the, the right shirt. <laughs> you did, Bruce. It's got a little longevity more than, it, yeah, all oh, those teams. I was looking at some of the <laughs> rosters of those teams. Oh, they were so bad. They were so bad. Yeah. All right. Mm. Not like this team. This is a good team. This is a great team. This is one of the great Oilers teams. Um, what do they have, 107 points in the regular season now? Yep, 49 wins with one game left at home to San Jose. So, and with something on the line. So I expect them to, to put their real team out on uh, on Thursday night. And uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to that game and I will be wearing said 93 blue on uh, Thursday night. And that'll be Derek Ryan's 500th game. So another nice milestone. But the orders are racking up milestones left and right. We should make this two good things, two bad things, and 20 numbers, the way things are going lately with all the all the oddball records and marks that the Oilers are setting. Just checking. Yeah. Four to one, the Knights are beating the Kraken. Yeah, so tonight uh, they are. Vegas maintains its two-point lead yep. in the standings, but there's one more game to go, and we'll see what happens. Bruce. Vegas at Seattle, San Jose at Edmonton. Edmonton needs to gain the full two points to to claim first place. So no but Seattle. You know, I mean, it's not like uh, uh, it's not like Vegas has a freebie, and it's not at home either. So, and Seattle's been playing real well. Does Seattle have anything that they want to, to play do? for? Yeah, I think they're locked into seventh, like the first wild card. So Let's they're going it. to get. Vegas or Edmonton. Yeah, uh, well, they could still or maybe tie Colorado. LA. They could yeah, still they tie LA. No, they, yeah? if they tie LA, Bruce, it looks like they have they have more regular season wins than LA. Okay, then they'll uh, they'll move up to third. So so LA would be, have to lose. Yeah, well, it could be Edmonton gets first, and then uh, uh, Seattle because Seattle beats. Uh, Vegas, but because Seattle beats Vegas, they'll move up into third. So we still won't get Seattle, but we wouldn't get. Uh, we get. Uh, if, we get Winnipeg. We got first, yeah. We got the second wild card team, which would be the Jets. I would. Um, it doesn't like Seattle's going to be a tough team to play. In some ways, mm -hmm. Seattle might be the toughest. They're the hottest. Well, they're a big physical team too. Like LA is not such a big team. Like they're not physically huge. The the King so. Um, Seattle does have some really big and rough players, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, keen for the Oilers to play them. All right, two good things, two bad things, and two numbers. We'll go with two good things each. What's your first good thing? Oh man, got to be Stu Skinner tonight, David. Uh, yeah. Just another another absolutely fantastic game from the rookie. Uh, I do believe tonight he tied Grant Fuhrer's uh, uh, Oilers record for 28 wins by a rookie. I have to look that up when I'm pretty sure he was one off. And uh, he won this one the hard way, uh, giving up a very tough and unfortunate goal early in the first period when basically two of his two teammates managed to team up and uh, 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 first of all shoot and then deflect a puck past him. Uh, on a very, very unfortunate play. Really almost no mistakes were made on the play. It was just... Uh, Bukestad trying to sweep the puck away, and then it hit it hit uh, the skate of uh, Broberg and went 
from right in front and in. And so from that one nothing hole, I mean, they always tied it up right away, but then it was 1-1, one, 1-1, one, 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 one. And Skinner made some phenomenal saves. The one that, I'm, that really stands out to me uh, was the one uh, two-on-one on in the first period, McKinnon and Rantanen. Colorado's yeah. two best players <clears throat> and two of the five players in this game, I'm going to sneak a number in right now, two of the five players in this game with a hundred points, <clears throat> which is the first time this has happened in a regular season game since 1986. And coincidentally in a game also involving the Oilers and uh, actually not that coincidentally it's happened five times in NHL history. There's been five 100 point players in the game and all five times the Edmonton Oilers are playing. So, We've, uh, we've been pretty lucky now to have a second highly dynamic offensive team in the city after the uh, really the greatest offensive team of all time. And so uh, anyway, they have two best players to get back to Skinner, break in on a, on a almost two on zero. I mean, the, the pass was straightforward and uh, Renton blasted a one timer from, you know, inside the, the near hash mark and Skinner came diving right across sort of a spread eagled out on his stomach and he somehow got his glove up and on the shot by Ranton and got it up and off the ice and also just inside the post. And there's not many goalies in the NHL who would have made that save, David. I'm convinced of that. That was a first rate. That'll be on highlights of the month and deservedly so. Just a, an absolutely <clears throat> terrific stop. And he made two more that I labeled as 10 bell saves that just looked like sure goals. And I know we're going to talk about one of them a bit later in the podcast, hint, hint, with, uh, with about five seconds left in the second period. Uh, and there was, uh, uh, I thought, that's just a terrific display by the young netminder. Uh, what did you say he had? Six five-alarm chances? Six five-alarm chances, ten grade-A shots. But the six five-alarm chances, a lot of them were very, very mm-hmm. dangerous ones. I mean, he... What impressed me about Skinner tonight, Bruce, was he just looked in command of the game. He looked very calm in the net, yep. very self-assured. And I think that's that helps a team to have a goalie who's carrying him. He's like, he's making all the saves, too. <laughs> Let's be honest. All that's of them. the most important thing. He's making all the saves. That's That's the main thing. But, man, he just looked solid. He's not – I think his weakness is um, – behind the net plays when they're passing the puck behind the net and coming out attacking from down low. Right. Okay. Um, his lateral movement from side to side, can, he can be a little, looks a little slow now and then at least, but he usually gets there and uh, anything that's coming right at him, he is just square to it. Calm blocker, blocker, blocker. He blocks mm-hmm. it with whatever he needs to do and he makes those saves, doesn't let in mm-hmm. many weak goals. So yeah, mm-hmm. just a, fantastic game do you think he can win rookie I, I don't think he can win rookie of the year Bruce um he, he's too late coming on as a contender for one thing he hasn't been in the conversation there's the American um Beniers in Seattle who is a much more high the profile player, yeah the yeah he's who. probably going to win it uh I do think that uh Skinner is emerging as the top goaltender uh, yeah I have pretty high hopes that he might be a finalist and I have pretty high hopes that he might and in fact should make the all rookie team and which is you know the best at your position as a rookie which is you know it's not quite the calder but it's not nothing and he uh uh, he's delivered the goods david bruce my good thing my first good thing i will go with the three pretty sure these are the three tallest defensemen on the team deharney nurse and ekholm and I thought, um, well, I'll just start with the Harney. Um, mm. He, Cody CC is here in Edmonton. He's waiting uh, for his wife to give birth to their first child, I understand. Mm-hmm. And the Harney was asked to step up and play top pairing with Nurse. He played more than 20 minutes. Nice. Uh, That's just the first. 2008. Uh, 347 was out on the, on the penalty kill. And he did, he kept a clean sheet at even strength, Bruce. He didn't wait, make any any mistakes on grade A shots against. I think that, um, I think it was Ekholm and Bouchard who asked to play the McKinnon line most often, if I'm not mistaken. But um, he had tough minutes and he was, he's just because he is, he is a, he is a really good hockey player. 
man, what a find for the <laughs> Edmonton Oilers. You couldn't have traded for a right shot, physical D-man who could kill penalties. Like, how are you going to get that player? He's been uh, in his role. He's been outstanding. And now he's now his role expanded. Tonight it expanded a little bit and he was outstanding. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's moments where he still can be a little tentative with the puck. Um, it's good that he's with Nurse, but he 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 compliments Nurse. I thought he 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 did well with Nurse. Um, Nurse has been for the last two months um, a tower of power on the Oilers' blue line. He was so again tonight. Yeah. He made a, a um, an absolutely crucial play that wasn't remarked on in the broadcast. Um, it happened very quickly, and I don't know if they saw it, but. Um, there was a, a a quick shot by the Avs, a great A shot. I think it was by Ranton, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. I, and um, from the kind of off a turnover in, in the high slot. And um, I think Fogel and Bouchard both uh, kind of muffed the puck in the slot. <clears throat> and uh, it went and there was a shot. And, and there was going to be a goal on the rebound. And Nurse stopped it with a stick check. That was his best play. Uh, but he was... He was uh, He's just skate. He's skating well. He's defending well. He's he's he is playing a more contained game. Yes. Um, I've heard it speculated. So. Um, I heard Jason Strudwick speculating that he thinks having Ekholm there has calmed Nurse down. That he doesn't feel he has to do everything now. That he you know uh, he's got a partner uh, on the left side. The two towers out there on the left side, and um, that's helped Nurse. He he just he he's making better reads. He's he's playing like a like a true number one demon. He would be like he's playing like a, a player who would be on Team Canada. Um, just his best hockey of his NHL career, I think. So, um, and then the Ekholm, um, he was in on he, he of course he scored the great slap shot goal. Um, uh, all five players were involved on the ice in that play. Um, I think it was uh, Bouchard who whips the puck up. Uh, Ryan makes a nice little pass. Fogel passes it over to McLeod, who drops it back, and Eckholm slaps it in through a Derek Ryan screen. And uh, Eckholm made five major contributions to Grade A shots at even strength, and two mistakes on Grade A shots again. So, and for a defenseman, that's just outstanding. So, um, David, that lob pass that Eckholm made to McDavid for the breakaway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I dropped a note to you saying that he dropped that in there like Tom Brady, just lobbed it up and over everybody. He looked up, saw saw the route. It wasn't a bank pass off the wall. It was going up top, up over everybody. McDavid bursts behind, takes the puck out of, out of the air in his glove. He's in alone. Just a fabulous. I, lo- I love how Ekholm thinks the game. I love how he thinks the game on the fly. It's interesting. We had a, a Hall of Fame hockey player at the end of his career last year, and Duncan Keith, in that same role that Ekholm's in now. And by this time of year, by the end of the season and into the playoffs, Duncan Keith was playing at a very high level, and processed the game at a very high level. He his passing was superb, but Ekholm's passing is as good as Keith's. And you know he's he's a much younger. He's about five, six years younger than than Keith at the same you know stage of their careers here. Um. And but his his passing is better than Keith's. His defending is much better than Keith's. Keith struggled now and then mm-hmm. to keep yes. up defensively, much better, and in in physical battles. And um, he's bigger than Keith, so he's a, he's a he's a significant improvement over Duncan Keith, who was pretty good in that same role so, at, by the end of the year. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, we can't say enough about. Ekholm, as much as everything's being said about Ekholm, it's it's almost like you can't say enough. He just keeps coming through again and again and again. And he and DeHarnay... Um, oh, oh, yeah, he scored the tying goal. Yeah, he did. <laughs> that he too, fired right? that way, you know, <laughs> through, through the Ryan screen, as, as I was saying. Yeah. yeah, nice play by Matthias Ekholm. Mm-hmm. Bruce, what is your second good thing? Yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go with the game-winning goal scorer. Uh, Evan Bouchard, uh, uh, the game-winning goal was just sort of the cherry on top of what I saw. It's mostly a very good game by him. What was his uh, a uh, scoring chance ratio? Um, four, uh, four major contributions, 
at even strength four right. and four mis four uh, major four, mistakes right. against, but three major contributions on the power play. And uh, right. so, okay. Yeah. Well, that's certainly where he did his damage at the end of the game. Uh, yes. I frankly liked some of his defensive plays in the, in the, uh, uh, first period, he was standing up, stepping up, taking puck off of guys. Uh, the backtracking forwards were helping in that they were sort of pushing the Colorado guys sort of in tight to the Oilers defensemen where they could then strip them. And there was some very strong two-way play, I thought, for much of the night. Obviously, mistakes sprinkle in here and there because it's hockey. Yeah. And that's, you know, what's going to happen. But there, there was a whole lot of... Uh, of, uh, there wasn't a lot of cheating going on, let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, uh, Bouchard was doing his part, stripping uh, pucks and uh, making some very nice uh, outlet and stretch passes, uh, getting the puck going north, but he was also dangerous in the uh, offensive end of the sheet. And he wound up with, uh, uh, well, just two of his eight shot attempts actually on the net, and I think they were both in overtime. Literally yeah. the play before, and then eight seconds later off the faceoff win, the winning goal, uh, and other shots that just weren't getting through, but uh, uh, came close a couple times. Like one of those blocks was kind of like a goal-saving block potentially, right in tight to the net. It was going to be a real tough save, and I just I liked his involvement. I liked his uh, engagement in the game. Like he seemed to be dialed right into it, and he was moving like he was, you know. He was moving with urgency, which is sort of all anybody's been asking for more or less the entire time he's been here. It's nice to see because you need that in the playoffs. You haven't got time to to survey uh, when there's back checking uh, forwards in the vicinity. Ryan McLeod found that out to his uh, chagrin one time in the first period. And of course, his first game in a month. And he sort of cruised into center in control and thought, okay, now I can sort of choose my play. And whoop, stick was up and the puck was gone. And the yeah. guy was going the other way. And, you know, that's playoff hockey. And this was a playoff style hockey game. There was really a lot of of uh, uh, attention to fine detail in this game. But uh, uh, to say that statement and then say, I liked Bouchard in that style of game is a nice compliment for this young player. I think there's... Uh, uh, he's really starting to show uh, upside. And, of course, that wicked shot in which he scored the uh, game winner to beat a very, very hot Alexander Georgiev in the Nets for uh, Colorado, George V. George uh, great shot right inside the post-top corner and, and just uh, perfectly placed at speed. Like that had to be 90-mile-an-hour wrist shot easy. Just yeah, a bullet and uh, and the net bulged and uh, uh, our house yelled in two places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey there, Georgi boy. How'd you mm. like that one? Um, he he did have one moment where he looked bad, but there was a number of Oilers. McDavid and Nugent Hopkins looked bad. It, it was when McKinnon's incredible rush up the ice. In the first period, which you already mm -hmm. talked about, we're with right, Rand that getting play, right, right, yeah, that's what he was. Bouchard first. was one of the people caught dead in their tracks. Now that's a tough play though, because he McKinnon is such an amazing hockey player. Like, there's only two players in the league who compared to McDavid and Drysaddle, I think, in terms of talent, and they're McKinnon and Makar. And uh, Makar wasn't in this game tonight, um, but um, yeah, Bouchard is. He is such a fine passer of the puck, Bruce. The owners haven't mm -hmm. had. A passer of the puck, this skilled on the team since Chris Pronger on defense. And um, they've had some good defensemen. Even in the decade of darkness, they had some good defensemen. You know, mm -hmm. Vishnovsky and uh, Whitney and Surrey and uh, Justin Schultz and Andre Sekera. And, but uh, Bouchard's passing is at another level. He's just constantly finding players with stretch passes and sending mm -hmm. them in dangerous chances. And mm -hmm. uh, his head's up, and he can make those passes um, uh, very nicely. Um, my, Where are we now? It's, um, oh, my second good thing, it must be. Mm -hmm. Connor McDavid. Connor mm -hmm. McDavid. Was, he came, the captain came to win this game. Um, he and Hyman tied for the most shots on net, seven each. 
But uh, of McDavid's seven shots, five of them were grade A shots. Um, wow. He 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 uh, he was just really flying around, and he didn't get rewarded uh, with a point until he uh, was you know kind of got a not a cheap assist, but he kind of a not that you know off the face off he put the puck back to Bouchard and he got the assist there. But it was his rush up the ice in overtime after Drysaddle had um, knocked the puck down and sent him in. Um, right. McDavid's rush up the drew ice. The penalty. They drew the penalty. Oh. Um, he had some bad puck luck on two of his best chances, once on a breakaway and once on the power play when he cut into the slot. He he bobbled the puck and lost it. But he he's just his game is showing a level of maturity and, and intensity that we first saw in the playoffs last year when he went supernova. And he's just he's he's gone, he's been pretty much kept up that pace all season long. And and thankfully he's been in the in you know in the last little while he's been joined by Leon Drysaddle there you know there's mm-hmm. two supernova sons in this in the Oilers mm-hmm. galaxy right now Bruce and yeah. um it's been uh fantastic to behold but uh, so it, just another great game I gave McDavid an eight in this game for which signifies a great game eight out of ten and uh yeah just stay healthy guys just stay healthy and let's see what happens mm-hmm. next. Bruce your bad yep. thing Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going going to say that uh, both uh, McDavid and Drysaddle had very strong shot shares on their two separate lines, and really three of the lines did, because uh, the Derek Ryan line was very good, and only the uh, uh, line with Cost and kind of kind of lost their part of the game. But they rolled four four lines and three pairings all game. So. Uh, my bad thing is, uh, uh, well, I had a few sort of little plays in mind, uh, but uh, that went out the window, and I am going to zero in on Rogers Sportsnet for missing half of the play on the game-winning goal. Yes. And this just keeps happening. It's like they don't understand that the game starts with a face-off, and you're going to show the whole – it's like – showing up 10 minutes late for the first period. You're not going to see the whole game if you don't see the start of it. Well, here in overtime, like they had this four on three, they had the puck moving around a little bit. They finally set up sort of a half decent chance. And then they show a replay and that's replay is just going on and on and on. And after about maybe 15 seconds of this puck being passed around on this replay, I'm saying to my wife, we're going to miss the face off. I know it. And then finally, Bouchard lets the slapper go, and then the goalie makes the save on the replay. And then they go to the live action, and Bouchard's already got the puck. I mean, this is the game-winning goal. Bouchard from McDavid and Drysaddle, two biggest stars on the team in the league, and Sportsnet missed the passes that they made to set up the game-winning goal in overtime because their heads were so far up their butts that they weren't monitoring. Like, don't they have a guy who's sort of telling the other guys, cut, go to live action now? Apparently not. Apparently it's not that big a deal. The producer, yeah. Yeah, like, wake up. (laughs) Seriously. I mean, I'm glad they scored, obviously, but right at the time I'm going, Jesus, just show us the friggin' game. I may not even put it as nicely as that. We had this complaint early, earlier in the year. From we me. Made, we made this point earlier in the year. I think both of us were really it's cheesed off that game. of mine for years. Well, I think that they had gotten better at it. And then, then um, uh, yeah, they kind of reverted to it there. Like, they just, they just show us. People just want to see the game is the truth. Yeah. And we don't want to hear. Uh, we just want to see the game and show us the game. So it, it, I don't know why. They, that's job one. Yeah. Do job one. Yeah. And then, you know, anyway. yeah, my bad thing, Bruce, I was going to go, uh, Yamamoto made a bad play with five seconds left, 10 seconds left. He first turns over the puck weakly at the blue line of the, um, abs. And then he's slow getting back on the back check and his player, it's Devon Taves who gets the puck and almost scores. Just no, terrible three, play. Three on two, yeah. Give yeah, it away and then let then lag terrible. on the back check. Like terrible, think- terrible. He's got to do better than that. He's he's he is he's he has been playing much better in the last six weeks. He's been his old self, mm-hmm. but he 
if he's not playing with full hustle and all out intensity, especially in that kind of open ice play, he, he shouldn't be, he's, he, he won't be in the lineup. He's got to do that. He's yeah. not, he's not good enough right. to slack off and allow that to happen. And he, he's, he's, he's got to realize that mm-hmm. and that just can't happen. And it did, right. especially with 10, 15 seconds left in the period, that kind of one to one. concentration, one to one game. If they had scored, yeah, I mean, it would have been the game very likely. Yeah, yeah, but so, you know, I th- there was a, actually something I want to focus on a little bit more. I think that the 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 Avs power play at the end and throughout the game was um, they didn't score, but they had the puck a lot. And I'll tell you what, Bruce, if Kale McCarr had been on the point, that now it might have been by design that the Oilers were actually in this game kind of saying off the point. And letting Devon Taves, who probably doesn't have a good shot, I'm guessing oh, he doesn't because he didn't didn't take it very much. But I was just thinking, if Makar's in that game, this isn't a one you know one one game. Mm-hmm. The 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 Avs are going to score because he the, the point when man was open all game long to get off some wicked shots and just I don't think Taves can execute that that kind of shot like Makar can. So um, the Bouchard. only thing I would. The only thing I would say about it is it might have been by it might have been a strategy in this particular game to allow that because they know that McCarr is not there. So, you mm-hmm. know, you're gonna you wanna cover off Ranton and McKinnon. You're gonna focus on those two guys, and maybe that's why they were leaving it open. But I just got the feeling, wow, if Kale McCarr's there. Now we don't know about the health of a number of the Avs players, whether they're gonna be back, um, what kind of level they're gonna be playing at. This this so this is, includes McCarr, Manson, and Landeskog, three really absolutely uh, crucial players for that team right um i have no sympathy for the avs they had none for edmonton last year when nurse and Le- and also lekin and also who's in their top you know their you know their very key, good player their core what is it the core 12 mm-hmm. um you know the Avs had no sympathy with nurse and dry settle hurt last year so i'm not gonna you know this is this is hockey this is the way it works i do think um if these teams face each other um, a lot can happen in the playoffs. It's no sure thing. No, certainly but, not. But it, if they face each other, it, I think injury will be the major factor. It's which team is beat, banged up, and injured the most is going to lose the series. And uh, so, so, you know, one thing to keep an eye on these playoffs is not just who wins the series, but, okay, are there major injuries? And do they are they able to dispatch teams quickly? Can they get through a series with, in four or five games, maybe like have that happen once in the first two rounds. That'd be absolutely crucial for either of those teams. Cause then it gets you a week off and players can um, heal up, which is right. a big, such a big thing in hockey. You know, when we, when we think of the players, Bruce having bad times of it this year, like Yamamoto's had a bad time of it. Hyman's had a bad time of it at Kane for a while. It's because they were injured. Yep. They, it's just it just consistently mm-hmm. goes cc was having a bad time of, for a while in the middle of the season mm-hmm. not quite himself and then you find out later oh yeah they're playing hurt and dry at the start of the year he's you know not doing so well on defense it, it's it's almost it's it's you know the more i watch hockey the more i realize this that these players they're always want to hustle they always want to give it their all sometimes they can't they're hurt and they're just trying to stick in the lineup and and um so hopefully Edmonton will will stay healthy through the playoffs. I mean, fingers crossed. Well, it used to be a secret to their success in the dynasty years of the 80s that they would roll through the early rounds of the playoffs. Yeah. And they would win in the minimum number of games or maybe five games in a best of seven series. And they'd always have a few games off between series, almost always have a few games off between series. And then they'd be fresh and ready to go in the next series. And plus that team had very, very good uh, health and, and injury luck generally, I would say, over those years. But they uh, did. They were uh, they were they were always seemed to be fresh uh, in the playoffs. I mean, you think of that 1987 series where Edmonton eliminated Philadelphia in game seven of uh, Stanley Cup finals here. And that was the year Edmonton went 16 and five. So they played 21 games. And Philadelphia went 15 and 11, so they played 26 games. And 
by the end, you know, it was Edmonton that had the energy advantage, and and I'm sure that had something to do with it. Was just their, they just didn't have so many miles logged over the course of the two month grind. Bruce, what is your number? Yeah, I'm going to go <clears throat> so many good numbers right now, but I'm going to go with uh, two minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, David, the Edmonton Oilers have won eight games in a row. And over those entire eight games, they've trailed out of 480, uh, what is it now, 481 minutes and 50 seconds, because this was the first one that even made it to overtime. They've trailed out of those 480 minutes, two minutes and 38 seconds total in the last eight games that the Oilers have been behind on the scoreboard. Believe it or not, they've been behind four times in that span. Uh, when they beat Arizona 5-4 to start the streak, kind of a sloppy game, they fell behind the first period. They tied it 50 seconds later. They fell behind 2-1 in the first period. They tied it 35 seconds later. And then they went ahead in the second period, and they, you know, when they uh, never trailed again. Next night in Vegas, Vegas scored early in the first period. Edmonton tied it 37 seconds later. And then in that game, Edmonton uh, got the lead, Vegas tied, and Edmonton scored right after that, that time too, within a minute. Uh, and then they rolled on to a big win that night. Then the last five games in a row, of course, they only gave up zero or one goals in, in any of those games, and they were never behind. And then tonight, they get behind early in the first period on that fluke. Uh, and 36 seconds later, Edmonton ties it. In other words, four times in a row, the Oilers gave up a goal to fall behind, and all four times they tied the game within a minute. Like, that's incredible. <laughs> it's it's almost you're almost expecting it now. Like, it's well, a, when's the good know. news coming? Yeah, 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 right away, right away. Don't don't hang around. You know, you don't need 60 minutes to overcome a one goal deficit. You need five seconds or 10 seconds of the right time and right place. And it just consistently they've wiped out those. Those mistakes or whatever caused the goal, they just gotten it back right away and then cruised on. So, and now, of course, we're up to six straight games with zero or one goals against and against long odds tonight, given they've given one up early in the within five minutes and facing Colorado. But Skinner just uh, stalemated them, checkmated them the rest of the, uh, the rest of the way. And it's it's starting to feel like a real thing, you know. It's uh, if the team turns it up a notch, and when they do, it's tough for other teams to match them. Colorado, I mean, give them credit; they stuck with Edmonton tonight. This was a pretty easy game, probably they deserved to win a meter. I haven't seen it yet, but it might be 55 or 60 percent, but it won't be 90 percent like it was for the last, uh, you know, six-one beatdown of San Jose. So, anyways, they uh, they did. I think they did deserve to win this game, and and uh, uh, especially after losing four straight overtime regular season overtimes to these guys, surely it was time Edmonton got the break and the win, and they earned the break and they got got the win. Bruce, um, my number is uh, Nathan McKinnon. I didn't. I hadn't been paying a ton of attention to the season of the Avs or the season McKinnon's house, but he's really crept up. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got 107 points, but uh, wh- where he's most impressive now, he's got his, his uh, points per game of players who have played um, more than 50 games this year in the NHL is third best in the league, behind only Connor McDavid at 1.88. That's his career mm-hmm. high for McDavid. Drysaddle 1.58 and McKinnon at 1.55. So 107 points in 69 games. He is having a fantastic season, and uh, I, I I can't. There's a lot of teams that I hate that the Oilers play. Many of them. I don't. I hate Dallas and Calgary and Seattle, L.A. Yeah. Uh, I hate the. I hate Seattle. And there's lots of teams because they stole Adam Larson away. And oh, okay. And um, anyway, there's which is they didn't steal him. He decided to go there, but so that's just stupid. But I still hate them. Hatred is often stupid, Bruce. Um, Anyway. Although Dallas, Calgary, and LA all deserve to be hated, um, oh. I can't hate the Avs. I just can't because they're such a fantastic hockey team. I admire them and the way they play hockey, and I really admire Nathan McKinnon and Kale McCarr. Can't wait to see them team up with Connor McDavid on a Team Canada. 
hopefully sooner than later before they're all too old to be still at their peak. Can, can you get that together, NHL, NHL owners, and uh, figure that out? Um, it would be nice to it, see, wouldn't it? It would be nice to see, Bruce, blithering idiots. Um, part, you know, it is partly due to the COVID pandemic, but anyway. Um, I sure enjoyed that World Baseball Classic. They were able to get it together. Yeah, they were. Okay, NHL, your turn. Yeah, yeah. And forget the Russians. Who cares about mm. them? Like, to hell with Russia. Just get have that tournament going. Anyway, um, Nathan McKinnon is a fantastic hockey player. And he's a bit of an oiler killer. Like, he, you know, he, he's such a scary player on the ice. He is so fast, so, so dangerous. Dynamic, he's a great eh? shooter. Yeah, he is just, what a what a great hockey player he is. And Makar, same thing. Again, Makar is the first player I've seen since McDavid came in the league who, who rivals McDavid in terms of raw talent in his mm-hmm. own way. He's a different player than McDavid. But um, I think he's... You know, he he got injured. Otherwise, I think he would be the Norris Trophy winner this year. I think he is the best defenseman in the NHL this year. Um, he you know he, his play in the playoffs last year was just out of this world good. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, Nathan McKinnon that that points per game is no surprise, and it's it's nice to see him having a career year for such a fantastic hockey player. Bruce, any final thoughts? Yeah, I do, <clears throat> David. I want to give a great big. This was, would have been my good thing if there wasn't so many good things in this game, but it's still a good kind of bonus good thing. The Edmonton Oilers organization, hats off to you for your extremely classy treatment of Cody Cece and for your extremely classy treatment of Jason Demers, which we talked about before. But since then, I started looking at it from Cece's uh, perspective. And what the Oilers did <clears throat> was they took him on the road trip, they won the big game in LA. Uh, they won the next night in Anaheim, and then they sent him home. And sort of the first word was, as well, his wife's having a, birth, a baby. He's gone home. And we were thinking like Skinner did. You know, he went home. She had the baby two days later. She's in her ninth month. She's actually, I don't think she's actually reached her expected date yet. But the Oilers said, you know, you've been a good soldier. You played 79 games. You've been banged up for a while. Uh, we want to do this thing for Demers and take a week peel up that core body and injury, spend this very valuable time with your spouse at this time in your life. We're going to look after this other guy. And when we get to Colorado, if we need you, we'll call you and we, you know, no, stay home. And we'll get Philip Brogue. We're going to give him a full game as the number six, you know, where he's not the seventh guy and gets buried on the bench after the first period. And he played 12 minutes in this game. David, I thought the Oilers handled that perfectly. Like that is human relations 101 A plus, how they treated uh, CC in this sort uh, of thing and how they treated Demers. Uh, and my hat is off to them. I don't know if it was Jay Woodcroft and I don't know if it was Ken Holland. What I do know is both of those are very decent men and it could have been both of them together or either one of them, but they did it right. And hopefully, CC, well, CC will be, I would think, be very happy with how he's been treated. And he'll also get that week off to recover from whatever it is. So I just think win, 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 win. And, and the way they were able to slide Demers in there in San Jose was just just perfectly executed. And my hat is off to Edmonton Orders. You did it right. CC has been trending up as a player. So I think he mm-hmm. has been healing up anyway. But I think you're right. Like, that's a very good reason. Just to, sure. you know, they really need to see. They really need Cody CC to play well in the playoffs. So just, just for the hockey related reason, yes. giving him some, some maintenance days is a, is a very, very good idea. Um, I, I didn't know that that, like, if that's part of their thinking, that's, that's good. You know, that has to be, I mean, they told them before the San Jose game. And my thought then was she's due right away. And then my thought was, you know what? They had two games off before that game. And then two game days off after that game, they probably just told them to show up in Colorado in five days and we'll win in San Jose without you. Mm-hmm. which they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but now they even t- didn't have him come in and, and gave Broberg this time. And, you know, it was a tight game, but it, it worked out for the best. But I think if I'm Cody Cece or if I'm Mrs. Cody Cece, I am very happy with my employer right now for 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 high-end human relations and, and just, you know, doing the right thing. My only complaint about Cody Cece is he's not number 10. 
because then he'd be 10, 10 CC. <laughs> All right. He's the only guy, I think, in the history of the league whose initials and last name are the same. CC. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>